we were with our pastor Tuesday, was it Tuesday? This past Tuesday. And he was just pouring into us. You know, he had, what, eight or ten other pastor couples there. And he just took a, a day and just poured into us. And he was, he was teaching us on, uh, on fear and, and, and how to, how to uh, deal with it, deal with fear. And, uh, but he made one, he, he, he mentioned one word, and that's what, I, mm, <clears throat> that's what I pray for you every week, is that one person here would get that one word. Because look, man, I, I, I'm not a fool. I understand that every one of you don't leave here changed every week. I'm not that naive, but I pray that at least one of you, and maybe the one's me, but at least one of us will get that one word that changes everything, that's a, just a, a game changer, and that's, what, that's truly my desire. But our pastor said one word. It, was not, it wasn't even what he was ministering on. It wasn't even what he was sharing about, but he said a word, and when he said that word, man, something left in me, and I said that's what I need. That's why I drove four hours. It wasn't all this other stuff. Yeah, do I need it? Yeah. Do I need to hear it? Absolutely. But it was that one word. And he said this word. He said, tipping point. And when he said that, man, I wrote it down. Because it leapt out at me. Tipping point. The tipping point. So this week, I, I just looked at that word and just thought about that word because I understood what it meant. But I looked it up, and this is what it said. It said, the point at which a series of small changes become significant enough to cause a large change. It's the point at which a series of small changes. That, look, that's what the Christian life is. It's a series of small changes. It's the small change, we call it repentance, but it's small changes. It's, I hear the word, and, and, and it changes the way I thought. You know, it, it contradicts what I used to think. So I bring my thinking into alignment with the word. That's called repentance. We, we, we often in, in, in church, we misunderstand or, or misinterpret the word of repentance with an apology. And repentance is not an apology. Repentance may include an apology. And I've heard pastors preach that you don't have to apologize. Well, look, let me tell you something. If I step on your toe, I'm going to apologize. All right? And when I step on God's toes, when I do things that I know have a, are offensive to him, I'm going to apologize. But repentance is actually changing the way I think. It's conforming my mind to the mind of Christ. So when I get revelation of Scripture, now I have to change how I think to come into alignment with the word, what the Word says. So that's the small changes. And a Christian life should be every day, small changes. Look, you get, that's why it's so important to get in the Word every day. Every day, get in the Word so you can make the small changes. Because if you don't make the small changes, the tipping point never comes. If I don't make small changes in my life every day, I never get to a tipping point. So the things that I desire, the things that I seek after, the impossible things that God's placed in my heart as a desire, I can never get that if I don't make the small changes that create the tipping point. The point at which a series of small changes becomes significant enough to cause a large change. That's what this tire is up here for. I wanted, I wanted to demonstrate tipping point. So let me, you know, my, my new personal trainer worked me pretty hard yesterday, so let me make sure I can do this. Yeah, Colverette back there became my personal trainer. All right, see right here, this is a, a strain. I want you, look, I want y'all to understand this. It's a strain to get this tire to here. I got to exert some energy to get it to here. And then right... At, at, at the breakover point is when it gets toughest. But you want me to show you tipping point? Right there. That's the tipping point. That's when everything's changed. That's when I, I believe and I trust God and I seek and I do the work and I press in and I press in and a load becomes heavy and I don't give up and I don't give up. Then all of a sudden, guess what happens? A tipping point and wham! 
everything that I've been praying for, now it's suddenly. You with me? It's a suddenly thing. It's like this struggle. It's like this heavy weight. It's like this load that's on me. And then I pray and I seek God and, I, and make the small changes. How did that tire get from on the ground to up here to its tipping point? It took a series of small changes, right? I had to, first of all, I had to beat, reach over and grab a hold. I had to change my position. And then I had to start exerting the energy to change its position. And right here, it's, that's, man, it's tough right there because it's heavy. And right there, you might think, well, it's impossible. It's impossible. And I know that tire's not, but there's something in your life. I'm just using this as a representation. But it seems impossible. And then it's difficult. And then it's done. You see... It took a lot of effort and energy to get it from the ground to up here. But when we got it there, it just went. It just went. It's like, all right, pushing your car. You ever push a but car? If you push a car, it's heavy. And then you get it going. I mean, it's like you, it's taking everything you've got. But then you get it going. And after you get it going, what happens? You can walk behind it with a finger and you just keep it going. What happened? You got to a tipping point. You got to the place where gravity took over. You got to the place where inertia kicked in and things just happened. It's just like that tire. I'm talking about the issue in your life. I'm talking about the thing that you deal with. I'm talking about the thing that seems impossible. I'm talking about the dream that you have that's so big. Look, if it's not a big dream, it ain't a God dream. And if you can do it on your own, it didn't come from God. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be bold enough to say that. If it's something that you can do on your own, that ain't a dream that came from God. Because God will give you a dream, always give you a dream that's bigger than what you can do because he wants you to rely on him. You, he wants you to depend on him. You have to be dependent on him. He wants to put you in a place where without him it ain't going to work. Look at the stories in the Bible, man. Look what he did. Can you imagine? You ever been thrown into a furnace? No. Them boys would have cooked if it wasn't for God. God always wants you in the place where your dream's too big for you. You can't make it happen. Therefore, the more you have at your disposal, the bigger your dream. Because the more you can do on your own, right? That's why he said, to whom much is given, much is required. Because he's always going to take you to something you can't do on your own. Before, just before the tipping point is when the strain seems to be the greatest. When the struggle seems to be the greatest. Not, not just because, you know, of angles and, 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 and physics. But because that's when you've been exerting the most energy. That's when you've been at it the longest. That's when you've been struggling the greatest, you know, for the greatest amount of time. And that's where most people give up. You ladies that have had children, when's the toughest part of the pregnancy? Right at the end, right? Right before the delivery. This is going to be the same with every promise of God. Just before its birth is when it's going to be the most difficult. And sadly, that's when the most, peop most of the people give up. They say, this is too much. I can't take it. But with childbirth, and we understand that the pain's not going to be much longer, and this is the big grand finale, right? And then after that, as soon as, look, it, it's amazing, because I, I've been in there with, with two children being birthed, and I've seen the pain, and I, I'm glad I don't have to do it. Look, just the epidural, I'm not going to do it. I'm not volunteering myself for that. I saw it. Uh-uh. I don't like needles. Not, especially not ones that long. But look, man, it's amazing that a woman can go through all of that agony. We got a little mama right here about to go through it again. She was willing to do it again. But as soon as it's over, the second it's over and they hand her that baby, that little slimy, 
nasty little critter that comes out of there. Look, one of our boys, I don't remember which one, saw pictures of themselves after they were born. He said, why was I covered with cheese? That's just how babies come, cheese-coated. But they take that nasty little thing, and they hand it to the mama. And guess what? She don't even remember what she just went through. And that's how it is with every struggle, spiritual struggle, things that we fight and, 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 and press into. And, go, and when it happens, and when you hit the tipping point, childbirthing's the same way. There's a tipping point. I've seen it. I saw two baby boys delivered, and I've seen hundreds of critters delivered. And there's a tipping point. When that head and them shoulders come out, everything else just goes. It's instant. It's just like that when that tire flipped. It goes from a big struggle to whoo. Like the little dog said when he got his tail caught in a lawnmower. It won't be long now. But things happen, man. Things happen. And it goes from struggle, struggle, then wham, suddenly. And I've seen it over and over and over and over and over concerning spiritual things. It's like, man, we've been toiling, we've been struggling, we've been laboring at this, and we've been pressing in, and we've been trusting God, and we've been fighting the devil, and we've been fighting our brain, and we've been coming against fear, and we've been, and then all of a sudden the phone rings. And everything that you've been believing for is instantly done. And all the fighting and struggling that you went through, you don't even remember anymore because now it's rejoicing. Now it's exuberation. Now it's all of those things. Don't lose focus. Understand there's a tipping point coming if you don't give up. Now what about when we got it to here, and, and can, can I say, oh, there's the tipping point. And when, no, it seems like it's never going to get here. And that's what we do, and we give up. When the tipping point was, it was right there. Y'all saw when I picked up this tire a while ago. When I got it up here, I could stand here and talk to you. I couldn't do it right there. Look, don't, don't think about it, this being just a tire. Think about what you're dealing with. Think about what you're going through. We're all going through different things on different levels. Before you reach the flipping or the tipping point, that's where the struggle or the strain is the greatest. Just before the tipping point is when you're the most tired. It's when you feel, look, women that gave birth, what did they tell you right before the baby came out? Don't stop. Don't stop. Somebody had to tell you that, right? Because if they didn't keep telling you that, the natural tendency is I'm tired and I want to stop. But you can't stop now. I guess you could. But the outcome wouldn't be great. Don't stop. Don't give in. Once the tipping point is reached, the momentum changes and the struggle ends and things to begin to move rapidly in your favor. The momentum causes the movement to, come, to become effortless and unstoppable. When things flip, it becomes effortless and unstoppable. It's caused by a series of small changes. It's caused by repentance. It's called by, caused by cha small changes in your thinking, small changes in your speaking, small changes in your action, small changes in your giving, then suddenly things tip and the momentum becomes rapid and unstoppable. The thing that you have struggled with is changed in an instant. The thing that you prayed so, for so earnestly for such a long time unfolds rapidly. We call these suddenly moments. Suddenly moments. It's when you've been pressing into this and it seems like it's never going to happen. But then suddenly, it all happens in an instant. It all happens in an instant. Josh, Matt, come see. I was corrected when I was in Oklahoma. 
And I was told that I, up there I can't say, come see, because they don't know what that means. You have to say, come here. But anyway, can you help me with that? <laughs> Ready? All right. Wasn't near as bad on me. He's acting. <laughs> it wasn't near as bad. The struggle wouldn't, wasn't near as great when there was two of us. The struggle was sufficiently less, or is sufficiently less, when you have someone come alongside you and help you to push and make the series of small changes that are needed to reach the tipping point. The struggle goes down considerably. Okay? John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit is what? Look, I'll give you a cheat sheet. It's right here. The Holy Spirit is what? But the helper, the Holy Spirit. So that's what Matt was representing up here, was the Holy Spirit in our life. God sent us a helper. And we don't even have to push by ourselves to reach the tipping point. Because if we do, honestly, some of the stuff is impossible. Like I said, God gives you a dream that's impossible. Well, that ain't fair, unless he promises to help you. So he said, now, that impossible dream that I gave you, the desire of your heart that seems impossible, I'm going to send you a helper. Because on your own, it is impossible. But I'm going to send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power. Anybody want power? You like power? How many of you like power? Every one of you. Because I can get on Facebook and watch when the power goes out. And everybody goes to complaining. Look, 30 minutes. Our grandparents, our great-grandparents, they live without it for their whole life. They lit a lantern, and they're all right. They went and gathered some wood, and everything was okay. But if we lose it for just a little while, look, I'm going to tell you what I don't like about it. Air conditioning going out. I can go without the lights. I can go without the stove. I can go without all that stuff, other stuff. I can even go without hot water. I take cold showers most of the time anyway. But when the air conditioner goes out, man, it seems like the world came to an end. So we all like power. I don't think it's electricity that God was talking about, but that's part of it. God made electricity. God don't, man don't make that. God made that. We just discovered how to harness it. <coughs> yeah, we just dis discovered how to harness it and use it for our good, but God made it. He didn't even have to fly a kite. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So how can you do the things that God's called you to do? Look, how could these guys... Look what he's telling them. He said, you're going to... He said, when my power comes upon you, you're going to take this gospel and you're going to preach it in your hometown. And you're going to preach it in your state. And you're going to preach it in your nation. But then you're going to take it to every place in the world. Look who he's telling this to. A bunch of guys at a point in time when they didn't have electricity, they didn't have the internet, because Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. Was it Al Gore say he invented it? Yeah, I think it was him say he invented the internet. Anyway, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have an airplane. They didn't have a car. They didn't have TV. They didn't have radio. So how are they going to reach the whole world? Pete and Joe, what they had? They had a boat that depended on the wind. And they had their feet. Best case scenario was a donkey. You know, that's bad when a donkey's your best option. I mean, man, you hit the bottom when a donkey's the best you got. Best you can hope for is a donkey. So they, they're at this time with these guys, 
And now he's telling them, you're going to preach this gospel around the world. Did they do it? Yeah. Because it all started with those 12 guys. And now, because of what they did back then, you know the gospel today. If it wouldn't have been for them, we wouldn't know. If it would have been for that scripture right there, that was impossible. There was no way for them to preach the gospel to the end of the earth. It wasn't even doable. But they did it. Because you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You are empowered to do the impossible when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You are empowered. Well, how's it going to happen? You're going to have to push in. And you're going to have to press and, and labor. And you're going to have to spend some time on your knees in prayer. And you, you may have to fast. And you may have to get out of your comfort zone. But then the Holy Spirit, like Matt did, comes on the side and pushes with you. And then things become a lot easier. And then it re all reaches a tipping point where it's all just wham. Done. Parakletos. Parakletos is the Greek word for the Holy Spirit. You know what it means in Greek? It means the one called to aid. The one called to aid. You shall receive power when the one that you call on to aid you shows up. But do you call on him? You shall receive power when the one that you call on that I sent to be a helper to you. When you ask his help, when you seek his aid, power comes. And now the things thought impossible become doable. Not easy, but easier. They go from impossible to difficult. Well, difficult is better than impossible. Right? We've known women who, they've been, they were told that becoming pregnant was impossible. But then they did it. Then it just became difficult. Because all childbirth is difficult. It's not easy. So it went from impossible to difficult. And then you know the next step? Done. That's tipping point. The things in your life that seem impossible, the plan of God for your life, the call of God on your life, the vision God gave you, the dream that he gave you, the, the, the season that you're in, seems impossible. Then it goes from impossible to difficult. Then next thing you know, wham, it tips and it's done. Man, this is such a good illustration of how God does things. God doesn't do them on his own. God don't operate on the earth. Here's a law. Let, 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 me, let me, without a human. All right, now here's a law. Here's, you want a, spirit, a spiritual law? You know, there's, th there's laws in the spirit realm that govern spiritual things. To operate on the earth, you have to have a, have a physical body. That's a law, a physical law that God established. To operate on the earth requires a physical body. That's why the Holy Spirit comes and lives where? In you. So because so for God to operate on the earth, he needs a body. Guess who the body is? Why we're called the body of Christ. Because Christ can't operate on the earth without a body. You're the body. Why do you think demons try to possess bodies? Because they can't operate on the earth without a body. Look what happened in the scripture when Jesus comes across the Sea of Galilee and he comes into the... Uh, the, the land of the Gadarenes, and what comes out of the tombs, out of the graveyard? A man, and he's possessed with a legion of demons, and he comes out and confronts Jesus. Oh, son of God, why did you come to torment me? Jesus just crossed the water. Why did you come to torment me? But what did they ask? He told him to come out, and what did they say? Would you allow us to go into the pigs? Why did they want to go into the pigs? Because even in the pigs, they could still operate on the earth. Because the pigs had the authority to be here. They didn't. You follow that? 
There was no authority for those demons unless they had a body. People are not your problem. Spirits that control people are your problem. Your problems are spiritual. All of them. Okay? Don't forget that. Don't get mad at the person. I know that's not always easy. I forget that myself very often. But keep in mind, there's always a spirit behind things. Okay? Spirits have to have a body to operate. I don't know how we got on this, but that's where we are. Paracletos, that's how we got onto it. The helper, the Holy Spirit, that desires to come and live in you. Has there ever been a day in your life, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking God where are we going with this. But has, I want you to question, you didn't nobody answer this out loud, just ask yourself. Has there been a day in your life when you invited the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of you? I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Has there ever been a day when you've invited the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of you? If there's not, I implore you. I, I, I ask you as, as I almost beg you to do that. Because that's where the power of God comes into your life from. That's when you can walk in spiritual authority. Because, like I said, without a body, even God doesn't operate on the earth. He needs a body. Why, why, did, why, was, why did God come in the form of Jesus? Because he needed a body. The Holy Spirit was given to us as a gift from the Father to come and fill our life with power. But we can't walk in that power if we haven't invited him into us. And you might say, yeah, I'm born again, but yeah, there's more. The, the disciples were born again too and then Jesus came to them and said don't leave from this place I want you to go out and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth but don't leave this place right here until my father has sent the Holy Spirit until you're endued with power from on high don't leave here because if you go out there there are people filled with spirits that are authorized now because they're in a body and they're going to eat you up and if you go out there without the power, you're not going to make it. So wait here for the power to come. And then Acts chapter 2, we call it the day of Pentecost. So the day of Pentecost happens and the Holy Spirit comes and then makes itself a home in the, in the life of man. But I want to ask you, I want you to ask yourself. Look, there's nothing eerie about this. There's nothing... Look. Church makes a big deal out of all this. And, and they say things, they'll, they'll get you all twisted up and confused. You go to the altar and have people pray for you, receive the Holy Spirit, they'll say, turn loose, hold on. Well, what do I do? Let go, hold on. Speak, don't speak. They'll get you all twisted up. It's as simple as this. Father, Acts chapter 2, I saw where you poured out your spirit on all flesh. And you said that you'd come make your home inside of me. So I invite you to come live in me. And the gifts that, you, that come with you, I want, them, I want to operate in those gifts too. It's that simple. It's not, look, you ever give your child a gift and say, okay, I'll give it for you. I'll give you the gift that I bought you for Christmas if you can get the formula right. No, that's silly, man. You give it to them because you want them to have it. It was a gift. And that's what the Holy Spirit is to us. You know what Pentecost means? Anybody know what that means? What is Pentecost? Brother Fred knew it. 50. That's what that means. We think about a Pentecostal church being a spirit-filled church. Or we think about the day of Pentecost is the Holy Spirit. It just means 50. It was a feast that they had in those days. The Feast of Pentecost. And you know what they celebrated on the Feast of Pentecost? The season of harvest. See, it goes back to what we said at the beginning. Huh? Tipping point. That's what... It, this isn't in my notes. I'll show it to you. This is the Holy Spirit bringing this stuff up. But it was a season to celebrate the harvest. It was a season to celebrate the tipping point. How did the tipping point come? How did the harvest come? 
when the power of God showed up on the scene and came and lived in the heart of man and empowered him to do the impossible. It's all about the tipping point. All the struggle, all the prayers, all of the, the sacrifices made, all of the changes. It all, it's all about that tipping point when things just happen instantly. You think, man, it's never coming. Then all of a sudden, like I said, one phone call, one trip to the mailbox, one whatever, one encounter at the grocery store, one chance meeting with a person, and it's all done. It all happens like that. I talked to Randy, called me the other night with several testimonies, huh, Randy, about when you had a, what would seem to be a, a, just a, an odd encounter with a person that you never, and they'd say, I don't even know why I'm here. I've never been here before. And Randy said, that's why I'm here. Because I have what you need. You see what I'm saying? Man. We call them divine encounters. When you just happen to run it. Brother David shared a testimony with me a couple of days ago. that it, Somebody called him to go play golf, and he told him no, because he didn't have time or... He, and he said he really didn't want to go because they want to go play at 2 o'clock in the heat of the day. And he said no. And he went and did his business and, he, and he, he said he felt like, man, I need to go. So he went and met them. They were halfway through playing, but he went and met them. And it happened where, it just happened where, just, I don't know where it happened, where he got in a cart with this man that starts telling him about some symptoms that he's been having. And Brother David said, I had those same symptoms at one point in my life, and it was a heart attack. You need to go get checked out. The man said, I will when I get home. You know, he lived out of state. When I get back home, I have a doctor's appointment. Next month, I'm get checked out. Brother Dave said, you need to go get checked out today. So that man did. And he's in the hospital now because he'd had several heart attacks and didn't even know it. And he was driving a 40-foot motor home, pulling another vehicle back to the other state that day, later the next day. What would have happened? We don't know. But a divine encounter, you see what I'm saying? God will put you in a place to, to pour into somebody or for somebody to pour into you. And that thing that you've been praying for, look, that thing that you've been seeking God for and praying about, all it takes is God putting you in the right place. Listen to the voice of God on where to go. We pray about the simplest things. Where are we going to go eat lunch? And there's been times, look, man, one time, we went and eat lunch at an Italian restaurant. I don't eat Italian food. I'll eat it. I don't like it. Okay, it's just me. That's just not my favorite thing. I want some rice and gravy. I want some shrimp. Uh, you know, I, I want some, some I, I want to stay on some meat. I don't want no red sauce and noodles. If you like that, great. But look, she told me, I said, where do we want to go eat? Look. How many of you guys know that? You don't ask that question. Because then it starts. And then I'll tell her, look, I'm pulling up to a red light. Before it turns green, you better come up with a direction for me because I'm not moving and people are going to be honking. And I don't care because I'm not turning till you tell me where we're going. You ever had that conversation? But we started praying about it. Lord, where do you want us to go? And we prayed. She said, I feel that we need to go to this Italian restaurant. And I'm thinking, oh, dear God. The one time she responded. But listen, listen. We went there with the understanding that this is where God's directing us to for a divine appointment. That after that, at that meal, our waiter got saved. Okay? Our waiter got born again that day because of where we went. And that happens not, all, not, not always, but fairly often where when we were at a restaurant, we were able to pray with our waiter or our waitress. Not all the time, but we're led. But listen, the thing is, it doesn't matter what you have planned or what you think you need to do. Seek the direction of God because what you thought you needed to do might not be where you need to be. And when you get where you need to be, then God has that other person who has exactly what you've been praying for. You follow me? Or exactly the word you needed to hear or exactly 
Maybe it's you that has what they need. A divine appointment. A divine appointment where you or that other person reach their tipping point. And then it just, wham. It just happens. I can give you testimony after testimony of how that's happened in our life. Pray about something for a long, I mean, just like it's never going to happen. And all of a sudden, one chance meeting, one phone call, what, whatever. And it's done. Ah, here's the scripture I was quoting a while ago. 20, uh, Luke 24, 49. I, I kind of got around, went all around it. But behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry, or wait, or stay, in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That's Jesus telling his disciples, don't go anywhere until you receive the power that I offer you. The parakletos comes along and empowers us with God's power. So God sent us the Holy Spirit to come alongside us, alongside of us and push with us to help us make the series of changes necessary for our, our situation to reach its tipping point. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't do it for you, but he comes alongside of you and he helps you make that series of changes until you reach the tipping point. Matthew 18, 19 and 20. And I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. So let me show you how else this works, this tipping point thing. Matt, can you come back? Josh, Tyler, Jonathan, come see. So I've got this thing I've been struggling with, and so I've asked the help of the Holy Spirit, and that's Matt in this instance, and then I've got some spirit-filled, Bible-believing friends that I've asked to come into agreement with me. So watch. Let's go. Let's get it. Y'all ready? Yep. Now look how much easier it is. Almost could, could have got you there, baby. <laughs> but you see, that's it, guys. Nat has some wipes if y'all need them for your hands. But see, now that's, what, that's something else God offers us, is this thing called agreement. He said we need two or more agree. What, what's agreement? That's just working in the same direction. It's simple as that. So we come into agreement, and what we're, we're believing for something. So we have that, that good friend or that couple of good friends that we can call because we know that they're going to believe God with us. I said they're going to believe God with us. I didn't say they were going to put it on Facebook and invite everybody to pray with us. Because that, listen to me, folks. When you do that, you might get a couple to pray with you, but you're going to get a bunch to talk about you. Okay? You're invited, you're asking for trouble when that, when that happens. Look, I understand the, 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 the idea behind it, and I understand the motive. It, it, usually somebody has the best of intentions. But I'm telling you, if I'm in a bind, I'm not, I don't want a whole bunch of people praying for me. Okay? I want a two or three, because God, God said right there, two or three. He didn't say hundreds, because hundreds aren't really going to come into agreement with you. All right? But if you've got two or three good friends, look, if you've got one good friend who you can come into agreement with, that'll say, look, I'm believing God with you. I'm believing God with you. I'm not believing you with you. I'm not believing me with you, but I'm going to believe what God says concerning your situation. I'll come into agreement with that. Jesus had 12 disciples, 11 of them pretty good guys, one of them demon-possessed. Jesus chose them himself, led by the Father. But even with the group of 12 that he had, who he poured into, who supposedly had his back, who, were, who, who he trusted with the gospel to get, to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. But when Jesus had a situation he prayed about, what did he do? There were three. He called Peter, James, and John. And he said, you three? Come with me. I, I got something I need to pray about. Look at the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Just a side note, you know what a Gethsemane is? It wasn't a place. They call it the garden at Gethsemane. It was actually the garden at the Gethsemane. A Gethsemane is an olive press. It's where they made olive oil. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. You think Jesus was pressed at the, at the garden of Gethsemane? Yeah. But without the pressing, the oil didn't flow. Okay, that's just a side note. I'm not going to preach a sermon on it. I'm resisting the temptation. But when he's at the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's to the point where he's sweating drops of blood, you ever been under that kind of strain? Probably none of us have. But even medical science says when the body's under the utmost of physical strain, it creates a condition where the blood will flow from the pores. And that's where Jesus was. He was at that place, and he's praying, Father, I don't want to do this. If there's any other way we can do it, let's do it another way. But, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Well, when he prays that prayer that changed everything, you talk about a tipping point, that's what that was. That's where then things just happened. 33 years he'd been preparing for that. 33 years he'd been pressing into it. 33 years he's been telling people it's coming. But now it happens, it gets to the tipping point, and it happens, wham, quickly. And when he's at the tipping point, right at the top, right at the apex where it, the strain's the highest, the struggle's the greatest, he gets three people to come pray with him. He gets Peter, James, and John, and he leads them off and he says, pray with me. And he goes off by himself, and he seeks the Father, and then he prays the prayer I just prayed, and he comes back, and what was his buddies doing? They were sleeping. And he wakes them up. Said, can't you pray with me for an hour? Lord, we, we're sorry, but we're tired, you know. So he does it again. And they go back to sleep. And then he does it again. And he finally just says, just come on. Let's, come on, let's just go back. Because now the one who's betrayed me is already here. And then they come and Judas kisses him. And they haul him off to Jerusalem. And things happen rapidly. Because they reached a tipping point. But take an example there. From Jesus, don't ask everybody to pray with you. He didn't even ask the other nine disciples to pray with him, or eight. One of them we already went to get the, the mob. But he didn't even ask them guys. He just picked three. Man. But you see how with the Holy Spirit's help and the help of a couple of people that you can really trust, the load that you're under can come up, become a whole lot lighter until it does flip in your favor. Amen? So God now promises the Holy Spirit to come alongside of us and empower us, but he also said that we can get others to come into agreement and push together till we reach our tipping point. We can make it faster and easier. Pastor Mike, one of the things that he, the statements that he shared a couple of years ago that I wrote down kind of like tipping point, but it was this one right here, and I've shared it a little bit. First it's impossible, then it's difficult, then it's done. First we look at our situation, and fear comes and whispers in our ear how impossible it is. Then we step out in faith in spite of fear and find out that it's not impossible, but it is difficult. But then we ask the Holy Spirit to get involved, and it gets easier. And we ask a couple of friends who are spirit-filled, Bible-believing, to come in a cool agreement. And next thing we know, we reach a tipping point. And it begins to move rapidly. Momentum takes over, or makes it, or the momentum that comes makes it unstoppable. And then it's done. Then it's done. It happens rapidly, and it's done. Look, I, I, I had a whole message to preach this morning about, about the, the kingdom in you. And, sowing into the kingdom the, the, what we've been on for the last several months. And God brought this to me, and I didn't even know how I was going to present it. Because normally I've got about five pages of notes, and today i got about this much. So I didn't know where we were going to go. But this is for us. And I want you to get this, because where you're at in your life, if you don't give up, if you continue to press in, it's going to flip. It's going to flip. And things will happen quickly. Things will happen suddenly, almost instantly. 
everything changes. Everything changes very quickly. Recognize it as a season, but seasons change. Recognize it as a season, and seasons change rapidly. How do our seasons change? It was, it's hot yesterday, and last night a cold front came through, and now it's cold. Cold left here in, in, in short pants on his way to Argentina, but he crossed a line. He crossed a tipping point where he went from one hemisphere to another where things changed quickly. Right, Cole? And you got out, and how cold was it, Cole, when you got off the plane? Seven degrees Celsius. Seven degrees Celsius. Forty degrees. 40 degrees. So he went from Louisiana to 40. Okay? Wasn't prepared. It happened quickly. Things change quickly. When, when, when you cross the line, that's all he did was cross the line. Okay? All he did was cross a line. Things in your life will change quickly when you cross the line. But you can't give up. You've got to push to the line. You've got, you've got to have somebody come along with you. You've got to have the power of God working in your life. More than I know right. that it's not easy. God knows. But he desires to empower you. He desires to help you. 